So this is our last session of the day, and it's much looked forward to by many of you. Some of you, some of our folks had to leave early, but they promised they'd be streaming. So we look forward to having them streamed. It's my pleasure now to introduce Dr. Lael Duncan. Oh, excuse me, wrong script. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce our closing speaker, Diana Gray. Diana is the founder and president of Hospice and Healthcare Communications and board president of the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation. She's a global keynote speaker, author of hundreds of articles and textbook chapters, as well as a TV, radio host, and guest. Diane has also been the parent caregiver for a child diagnosed at age five with a neurodegenerative disorder since her son's passing. She has dedicated her life to improving care for all adults and children facing serious illness. Please join me in welcoming Diana Gray. I like when she called me Dr. Lou, right? <laughs> you were Thanks. almost there. Thank you. Hey, um, thank you everybody. I really um, I appreciate you sticking around, first of all. I know that you have a choice, and I know that sometimes we can kind of scoot out early, and you might want to, but I appreciate you sticking around. Um, first of all, thank you so much for a great conference. Judy, you and your team um, you know, have done an amazing job at really creating cohesive content um, that helps not just providers do the care, but we all know that we'll help patients and families and their children and the children after them and the children after them. So thank you. So first of all, I want to apologize to the physicians who gave the last talk. Um, as is the case, and you guys know this, that sometimes when we uh, plan, and we plan to do a talk at a certain time, the worst thing happens, and there, our patient that we have been knee deep with for weeks and weeks dies. So that's why I was in and out. So please forgive me for um, hopping in and out of the last session. But um, this, kind of ha this very special patient has a role in this talk, and I want to talk about visionary partnerships and palliative care. But the way that I want to do it is to start off by saying, you know what? I wanted to go into medicine. In college, I studied neurology. And I studied sports medicine. I really didn't like much of everything else, but I did love neurology. And uh, went down the sports medicine, sports management track. And as I went down that road and got married and had kids and thought, OK, I'm going to have this type of life, life had other plans. And I'm going to introduce you to my son. Um, that's my son Austin and my daughter Christina. And when he was diagnosed with NBIA disorders, our lives changed forever. And for those of you that don't know, um, NBIA is neurodegenerative with brain iron accumulation disorder. It's a rare disease, one in a million. And sure enough, I ended up with a child with a rare neurological disorder. And our physician was wonderful, uh, really. I know we all have those doctor stories. I got a great pediatric neurologist for my son, and basically he said, Diane, it's a terminal brain disease. He might be here for two more years. We'll try to keep him comfortable, but again, I'm sorry. Will you please call for a follow-up in three weeks? And by the way, Merry Christmas, because it was Christmas Eve, and I'm so sorry. And while he's talking to me, and believe me, he did not want to have this conversation, but you know how we patients sometimes can be the most stubborn things on the planet? I begged, and I pleaded, and I said, I don't want to wait over the holiday, and I do want you to tell me. And he said, no, we're going to wait till after Christmas, which we know, right? And I said, I need you to tell me, and he did. So after that, I'm having this conversation in my head. Thank you. I, I hear that you're upset. In two years, Two years, are you kidding me? And by the way, wait for two to three weeks? But he was being compassionate, and he was being professional, and he was trying to give me space. And by the way, 
Merry Christmas, how am I going to be Santa for my kids and my family's coming? And by the way, hang up. No, don't hang up. Stay close. And it's this pusher puller system. And then for there, I said, thank you. And God bless you for finally giving me a diagnosis because we'd been searching for three years, which is often the case for families with rare disease, right? But then I've got to go. It's Christmas, and we're having our family over. So then we went from the little guy on the left playing tennis in the street to the little guy on the right in the feeder seat in the span of four years. Austin's disease, uh, he presented with spasticity, dystonia. A lot of you have patients that cope with those disorders. Um, there was another child like Austin with the same disorder at Providence Trinity Care a while back. And the common theme for medical professionals who treat these kids is I don't want another one of them with that syndrome ever again. So as Austin progressed, pain management became the focus of our conversation. And it really, literally, I, the fact that I'm standing up here amazes me because I was your worst nightmare. <laughs> All of you that came to me that would have said, by the way, have you considered hospice because it's an incurable disorder? Or, hey, what about palliative care? I, um, salty is the nice language. <laughs> That's the word. It wasn't uh, well received by me, and I think I said, mm, you. And um, really, I've got this. We've got it. But I didn't have it. In fact, I didn't have it for four years. I dialed 239-261-440 and hung up for four years. It was only until my son was laying on the floor on a Sunday night at 9.30, um, backward arching C, epistotonus. Do you guys know what that is? Have you ever had a patient? It's the worst thing you've ever seen. It's basically a dystonic posturing that happens when the head reaches back to touch the toes. And I'm, I'm crying, I'm wailing, my son isn't stopping. I finally called hospice on a Sunday night. And that's what it took. But the reason it took that is because we'd been in the hospital and were just discharged for 32 straight days without a pain consult. True story. And on the 32nd day when we were in the hospital and the doc came, to his credit, this is not about bad doctoring. This is about cultural norm and difficulty in having conversations that have to do with end of life in children and some adults, but also on the topic of pain management. Because here's what happened. When the physician, the pain management physician, came into our room in the hospital, he said, Diane, we need to put your son on, on morphine. Now, I freaked out. I don't know about you guys. Pre-clinical term, pre-education, if you would have said, ha, not my kid, because that's what I did. I said, you are not get, it's a narcotic. I mean, I knew enough to be just totally undereducated. He said, Diane, it could this, it could that. Here are the, you know, the Zimbalta commercial where it goes, Brrr, all those things, okay? I was that person. I could hear all the, and I could hear him, and it was fuzzy, and it was blurry. It could slow his respiration. It could cause a slower motility. It could cause, you know, loss of blah, 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 blah. I heard all of that. So here's what I said. These were my questions. Won't it kill him? Won't it make him stop breathing? Won't he overdose? Very common questions. And by the way, those questions are the same questions now, all these years later, that I get from families. Isn't it addictive? How many of you have been asked, just raise your hands, when you discuss opioids, isn't it addictive? I did. I said the same thing despite the fact that my son was going to die. The brain wasn't doing a mashup. Don't we have another choice, I sobbed. So what did I do? I pushed back. And I took my child home, which he was discharged anyway. But here's what I ended up learning, and I want to share this with you, because I hope that all of you take this to heart. What I learned is that I needed someone to tell me the flip side of that commercial. 
Diane, by the way, if we get his pain under control, we think that morphine is the best choice, his personality will return. By the way, properly prescribed opioids allowed our entire family to have fun, that F word. We don't use it, fun. We use an entire beautiful vocabulary to discuss a glossary full of terms that families don't relate to. They relate to the F for family. They relate to the F for fun. Also, too, I really did learn that early communication of the positive effects of morphine would have helped me immensely. Here's why. What happens when you take a screaming person who is upset, who is crying, who is pushing back from you? What happens when you try to talk to them about the one thing that they don't want to hear? They go like this, whoop, wall up, right? So what would happen if we started having conversations earlier, meaning at the time of diagnosis, starting to introduce a little bit of the element of pain management? At some point, we may have to consider pain management protocols, blah. We don't have to discuss the specific, right? Because we don't know, right? At some point, I wish someone would have discussed pain management with me earlier on, especially when we know that some diseases are absolutely going to need pain management protocol. I would have fought back, and I would have cooperated a lot more, which, by the way, helps you guys to be a lot more time efficient, right? Because you're trying to cram all this in with all of these patients in a day. But I wish, too, that someone would have introduced this to me. This is a Dougie letter. Now, I know if you'll stick with me, it looks like it was written for a kid, and it was, but I'll tell you what, a lot of us parents and family members and patients, we kind of all feel like screaming nine-year-olds nine when we're talking about end of life. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to discuss it. The thing that I found about this that helped me is that it talks about circles. Everything in life is a circle. Day follows night, spring comes after winter. When a boat disappears beyond the horizon, it is not gone, but just out of sight. Think about the visual there. It really helps. That was written by Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. That's her handwriting, made with her markers, for a little boy named Dougie, who was dying of cancer. I use that document with a lot of my adult patients. Why? Because what, what does fear do? It shuts people down. It makes things difficult to interpret. As well, I have noticed this, so I speak and teach all over the world, 80% of the learning is done visually. Yet, what do we do in healthcare? We spend so much time talking about talking and very little time explaining or asking people how do you learn best? Are you a visual learner? Are you an auditory processor? Or what about kinesthetic learning? I think it's time that we start looking at visual tools to help patients and families process impending end of life. And also, too, because I do believe that we're big kids at heart, a lot of us need help. But my little guy didn't. Because what he said was, when I go to heaven, mommy, will I run as fast as a jaguar? When I go to heaven, mommy, will you hold my hand? The only thing is I hadn't told him that he was going to die. I hadn't even told him that he was seriously ill because I had found out just a week before. I hadn't even told my entire family. So do kids know that they're dying? I think so. And what about other children? You know, a lot of times we're talking about how to make people aware of palliative care and how we're going to really help consumers move forward, move forward with their acknowledgement and their understanding that death is a part of life. Let me tell you something. We need to start recognizing the kids in our world because they are pretty smart 
and they are pretty savvy, and they are very wise. So the last week of my son's life, a little boy named Finn was at a little dinner gathering. Some families had gotten together to cook us dinner, and I went down to pick it up, and Finn was there visiting from London. I lived in Naples, Florida at the time, and Finn said, I want to draw you a tattoo. Three years old. I said, oh, sure, until I noticed it was with permanent marker. <laughs> um, so I rolled up my sleeve. He drew on my arm, and I said, Finn, can you, what is this? He says, it's your house. And I said, oh. He said, and the butterfly is going to go up, up, up in the sky and be happy forevermore. Finn was visiting from London, had never met my family, didn't know my son was dying, and drew exactly my truss line. That is, I had two palm trees equal to the height of the roof in my house. And Finn had never been to my house. He didn't know where I lived. So do kids get it? I think they do. And by the way, families like mine, they want to trust you. Because sometimes we have to do more, though, to build that trust, right? And quite often they want something good, like I did, to come out of it. Ira spoke about making meaning and finding meaningfulness. You're going to see more and more of this as a trend in the next year. I know of three books that are coming out. I think Maria Shriver just came out with a book on finding meaning. I, knew, I know of some other ones that are coming out as finding meaning after loss and finding meaning in end of life. And by the way, if you ever want to read an amazing book, how many of you have read Viktor Frankl's book, Man's Search for Meaning? Okay, if you haven't, get it. Ah, fabulous book. And what it talks about is finding meaning. It was written in nine days by Viktor Frankl, who was a psychiatrist and also a neurologist. And it was written after his entire family was killed in the Holocaust. Now, the reason this book is powerful and it's amazing is because I read it as a caregiver. And I decided at that time, and it was one of those things that popped off the shelf, and I read it and I said, oh my goodness, I have one child who is dying. And yes, it was horrible. But these people went through their own personal holocaust, and I was going through mine. And as soon as I saw in that book that there is a way to navigate by understanding and finding meaning, it made all the difference in the world to me. How many of you read that uh, study in 2015 from Stanford that talked about physicians who felt frustrated with having communications with end-of-life patients outside of their own ethnicity? Anybody read it? 99.9% .9 of the physicians were frustrated with having end-of-life conversations with um, patients of, a, of an ethnicity other than their own. Ah, true. But what the study also showed is that what we say matters. It also showed that um, having end-of-life conversations when the patient brought up the topic of God, that the physician felt out of his or her league. But even in moments of discomfort, we know that how we exhibit caring and compassion matters. So the study also reflected that physicians in that study were frustrated with the fact that patients and families did not understand medical vocabulary. Are you kidding me? So what is going to happen? So what happens when the physician is frustrated with the patient and the family because they don't understand the medical vocabulary? This is what is exuded. Everyone is a genius, but if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it's stupid. It's true. So we need to do a little bit better about meeting the middle of the road. And how do we build that trust? I love this research study by Dr. Marshall Levittown. But basically what she said is that if we do a better job of having compassionate communications with patients and families, here are the outcomes, folks. Greater adherence to treatment plans. Who doesn't want that? Better health outcomes. Increased patient satisfaction and loyalty. Reduced malpractice claims. Increased clinician satisfaction. I don't know about you, but I want to feel good about my job. So all of these talks about increased communication and compassionate communication, it's worth it. 
How many of you are familiar with social determinants of health? Here's the thing. There's the breakdown. I put them on the slide for you, okay, because you're going to be able to see this. Check it out. It's super important. Why is it important in palliative care? Because we're not taking care of just the patient. We're taking care of the patient and the caregivers, right, and the family. And social determinants of health, we have to look at them as it pertains to the family members as well. We've got a lot of work to do. This, these metrics are going to happen. They're being dialed in and put into certain metrics and tech companies now that are doing the work. So social determinants are going to become more and more and more a part of this program of care. Here are the core social determinants of mental health. Why is this important? Because not only can we prescribe medications that's to, to cover up all of that, what would happen if we actually started looking at it at the beginning and we made the end of life process more meaningful? Because we know that discrimination, poor education, employment, unemployment, poverty, food insecurity, and housing instability are so important and our poor social workers are getting bogged down. So I think it's time for us all to start to do some of the heavy lifting. I put this in here because I, how many of you have read the um, Stanford's Clinical Innovation newsletter, right? I love it. I think it's great. It's got good content and in it, it says though the number of de dedicated palliative care teams at larger hospitals is growing from 53% in 2008 to 67% in 2015, less than half of 8% of the admitted patients eligible for palliative care actually get it. Yeah. So what do we have to do? I want to go back to the great panel that was just in, up here. Thank you, by the way, by, for setting the stage for this part of the talk because she talked about empowering family members. We have got to start empowering family members to do more caregiving because we need them. We do not have the bandwidth. We do not have enough qualified palliative care providers to do the job, so we have to empower family members. And the way to do that is to start helping them by understanding social determinants, teaching, education, advocacy, and we can build a hammock of support. And I'm going to show you what it might look like. A hammock of support, remember, visual learning, right? It can teach families that if one string breaks, you won't fall through. All this language that we use about a care plan, I had a care plan, heal my kid. Goals of care, heal my child, fix it and make it better. I didn't want to talk about all of these qu quality of life, oh my word. If I had something every time I heard, now let's discuss quality of life. I just tuned everybody out and I didn't want to. I understand medicine, I understand neurology, but I didn't understand nor appreciate the language. By the way, the average healthcare um, person in the States, the average consumer understands healthcare on a fifth grade level. So what are we doing? We're wondering why this is, our language is not getting through. Folks, it's because the average American understands healthcare information on the fifth grade level. There's your hammock. Let's show them what a hammock looks like because they understand a hammock. Because here is the shortfall. Here's what happened to us. Like many parent caregivers, I realized that much of life was about the basics. Do I let my healthy child go to a sleepover? Do I let her roam a little bit further on the playground because I have one hand on a wheelchair and she's running? What do I do? What about Christmas cookies, class projects, my undivided attention? These are the things, and not just pediatric care. This is true for adults. I'm caring for my husband. What do I do about my daughter? I'm caring for my wife. What do I do about my job? It's constantly this. So besides losing my son, this is the biggest heartbreak. And by the way, she saw way too much in terms of physical care. So here, I'm going to ask us to consider flipping this hierarchy that we so often create ourselves, and I know it because sometimes I do it too, 
Take that hierarchical, siloed thinking and flip it upside down. Because guess who's at the top of my chart? Besides the family, volunteers. Right? It's time we start looking at the volunteer base in America and start to figure out how to access it is part of building this hammock of care. Because life moves on and so does the clinical team. But guess who can choose to stay with the family throughout that transition so they don't feel abandoned, that they're actually falling through the hammock? Our volunteer corps. And if you look at the statistics for volunteerism in the world, we have the highest rate of volunteers in the entire world. So that is an un underutilized resource for us. Think about it. The nursing staff, they're on to their next patient. And when does the bereavement team come in? And God bless them because they're important. And by the way, they are underutilized as well because of stigma, cost, etc. So when do they come in? After the patient died, right? So what happens in between that time? I know in our case and with many of the families that I work with, there's a gap. The person that I loved and depended on most was on to the next patient, which is what happens. But a volunteer could have helped to have eased that transition. And by the way, they're nice on the budget. Let's talk about complementary care, another string in our hammock. They all exist. What would happen if as our patients and our families come in, we show them this is what the hammock looks like and start teaching them that all of this is here for you rather than hand them with lists. What if we start to show them this is here for you? It's a tough time, but at least using visual imagery, we can start to create this hammock of care and hammock of support and teach them. Reiki, healing touch, we did sermons at our church, and I mean sermons, multiple. Prayer ceremonies, we had four different friends offer four different religions, and I said, bring it on. Because you know what? I'm happy to have a Buddhist in my house as I was to have a rabbi. If they want to pray for the well-being of my child, bring it. Good by me. Some families aren't like that. I know a lot of families that are. Music therapy was fabulous for us. We, somebody came to our house and sang every week on a Wednesday. Aromatherapy was fabulous in our case, in some cases not so much. Friends and meditation, and I did meditate with my son quite a bit. But what happened in our house, there was much discussion over the involvement of other children. And I'm guessing, have any of you ever had families that want the children not involved? Right? Can you raise your hand? Because I think this is important for you guys to look around. Look around and see how many of you are raising your hand where they don't want children involved. I think it's time that we start calling it out and saying flat out, there's a good chance they know anyway. And by the way, to go with Elizabeth Kubler-Ross's model, Elizabeth, before she died, she really, really wanted to create a model where adults and children would coexist one gives life energy to the other. We know it's true. And by the way, in our care model, in our hammock of care, because we were a think outside the box, that is Arthur, Mark Brown sent Arthur to our house. I do not know who knew Mark Brown, but I am thankful. So that's Arthur. Neighborhood kids came and read to my son. I didn't ask them, their parents encouraged them. And we did have a very large community of care. As you can see on the top right corner, we had a volunteer, we had friends, well, our nurse, and the younger kids. And on the bottom left corner, that's Melissa. Melissa became an ER doc because of her experience with my son. So you wonder the outcome here? We've got to start involving our kids as part of education and advocacy. But for us in this outside the box thinking, what does that look like, right? Well, guess what, folks? Florida Power and Light has a program that you can actually request a letter. You can have it notarized. You fill out the letter, and it says, we are a special needs family, or we are a hospice family, or a palliative care family. It doesn't guarantee that you're going to get care faster or get reconnection faster in a storm, but it does make them aware that you are there. And I'm telling you, in the middle of hurricane, whatever it was, Charlie, the one that went out to the Gulf, 
and it turned back around in 45 minutes and pummeled our neighborhood, I was mighty thankful. And when I spoke with the phone company, you know what they said? Get a rotary phone. And you know what? I used the rotary phone during the hurricane because my cell phone didn't work. Our church was a valuable part of our community. I know a lot of you know that, but I am wondering if maybe there's a way, question, maybe there's a way to start educating people on the amazing things that happen, especially the death-fearing people out there. Well, if you're fearing death and you're fearing solitude, find a place of worship because they are an amazing resource. Again, F is for free, right? And we've got to maximize our resources because we don't have enough people and we don't have enough time and we don't have enough money. Churches are amazing places. When I have someone referred to me for grief or for end of life, I can usually pick up the phone and call whatever city that patient or family member is in and find a church that will open their doors and do the work just by a phone call. It is amazing to me. Over and over and over again, I have called churches to help out in a neighborhood. Regardless of what religion the person is, they don't care. They actually reach out to the person and follow through if the patient is willing. Our neighborhood had a, fam a neighborhood meeting a neighborhood meeting. What if we shift the paradigm with patient consent and family consent and said, let's talk about that old-fashioned thing called a neighborhood. There's a thought. Free. People get together and let's see what we can help each other. As well, Walgreens. I don't even, and I could be, I shouldn't have said the brand name, but that was ours. You know, <laughs> But the gist of it is that the pharmacy was a valuable resource, as well as the pharmacy that delivered the medication for my son. Valuable resource for us. The DME team, again, how many of you are aware of at-risk registry? Whoa. Okay. It's a part of a company, and I'm not giving a product, you know, I'm just saying look to see who is doing the work in the space because at risk registry, what they do is they help do patient tracking in the midst of a natural disaster. Remember when Hurricane Katrina came and all those hospices lost track of their patients? There's a way to help you find the patients, okay? Project 4031, amazing. I do what they do. And what that looks like is when people call me and they say, hey, Diane, I have a dying mother, father, child in wherever part of the country, I refer to a hospice. And I give a list of hospices usually. Here are two or three right in your neighborhood. Here's what hospice does. Project 4031 does that too. They're located in Texas. They have a vast wealth of information. It's a not-for-profit, and that's what they do. As well, CareFlash is, has community data. You can look at CareFlash yourself, and as well, we know that schools are enormously helpful in times of tragedy. Either they are an emergency shelter, or they will actually loan your, their space for you all to use and they also have all kinds of things. And by the way, on the palliative care paradigm, if we could start including school nurses, okay, for pediatrics, whew, there's, a, there's an idea. They want to help. They want to participate. They want to be part of the palliative care continuum. Plus, a lot of them have these kids for however many hours a day. So who's the person, I don't know if she's still here, that was talking about patient navigator? And in terms of building community, I would love to share this with you. Please, please, please consider partnering with patient navigators. I am one. A, I don't charge you. B, we're here to help. C, most of us are really well trained. We're not here to take anybody's patient. We're not here to overstep bounds. But what we do is help build a bridge between the patient who is sitting at home or in a hospital who's refusing care or who wants to stay at home 
and we just share information that says, here are three hospices, here are two palliative care communities, etc. We build the bridges, we make the connection, we stay with the connection a little bit, and we step out and let the, the clinicians do the amazing work that you guys are so well trained to do. Also, end of life doulas. I've heard, I've heard many things from the hospice community about the end of life doula. And again, I'm gonna go back to the fact that folks, we do not have enough trained palliative care providers in our country. We don't. So one way to help people is to start talking to end of life care doulas and bring them into your mix as volunteers. Many of them want to volunteer. That's why they're doulas. They're not, they don't do this to earn a full-time living, many of them, not all. But bring them in as volunteers into your program and they can help out. As well, University of Wisconsin has an end-of-life certificate study and they also do one on grief certificate studies. It's the only university-based certificate program. Why is it a good thing? Because we want our consumers to start getting educated. We want and we have to build a network and really a veritable army of people that are not necessarily providers, but that are super educated and can do advocacy. And these are some ways to do it. But also, this is one of the most under-discussed, ignored part of the palliative care continuum, folks. And every patient I sit with asks about it, and we don't talk about it. Team spirit. Now, you know from sitting with a patient, they ask about their beloved that has crossed over. But here's what happens when they start talking about it. Many clinicians go like this. I don't know. I'm not sure. Let me think about it. Because we don't want to sound unprofessional. We don't have clinical research about what it looks like to do a soul transplant, right? But people are asking anyway, folks. We have got to at least address the issue with an I don't know. That's a really good question. How do you feel about it? Because they're looking for their beloveds anyway. They're looking for team spirit. By the way, that's my great grandma and my grandma. They're on my team spirit. And by the way, along that line, I will share with you that the one thing, how many of you have had a patient ask about the other side, life after life? Look around, I want you all to see the hands. Whether it's here or wherever it is, will you please start talking to each other? Okay, and the reason is these patients and families want to talk about it. They want, they're, they're frustrated and they're confused and they're happy and they're joyous and many of you have these stories. So please talk to each other about it. It's important and it is not, um, it's not discussed enough, but I will tell you too, there is some research coming out on this from a university in the Northeast and it is super cool and it'll be out in about eh, three months on this, afterlife conversations. So what else is important in this hammock of support, this hammock of care? Facebook, Skype, FaceTime, and WhatsApp. Do you know FaceTime is HIPAA compliant? How many of you knew that? Yes. And if you have any questions, you call Providence Trinity Care, who has done the work and spoke to their legal team about it. It's HIPAA compliant. Now, here's the thing. How many of you know how to use Skype? How many of you know how to use WhatsApp? Facebook? Well, although today wasn't a very good day for Facebook. <laughs> um, and that's how we're going to shift this upside down. We're going to shift the paradigm of care upside down by using technology. Because here's the story of my little patient. So my little patient, M, was an 11-year-old refugee from the Congo who fled to Zimbabwe with his 10 siblings and two parents. They relocated in a refugee camp in Zimbabwe 
and when it was time to win the lotto to come to the United States, you could only take so many family members. And so what they decided was to send dad and seven children to the States, the oldest seven, so they could get an education and have a restart. And by the way, aren't we a country of refugees anyway? Just saying. So these refugees relocated into the South, and my patient, M, got cancer in December. Goes through the typical protocol, oncology, hot children's hospital, is referred to hospice. And this sweet little boy actually um, grew on everybody's heart. And the hospice reached out to me and they said, Diane, we need, we, we need, we need your help. This family's falling apart. I don't live where this city is. I do this all the time. People call me from wherever because they're having a problem. And they said, our, our little boy, our little patient wants to talk to mom. And I said, okay, so he wants to talk to mom. I got it. And so what's the problem? They said, we don't know where she is. And I said, well, where did she, we last see her? And they said, Africa? He said, Africa, the whole continent? Yes, Africa, the continent. We don't know where? Well, we think she might be in Zimbabwe. Any particular place in the country of Zimbabwe or just the country? We don't know. So back to that hammock of support and our community of care, I reached out to ICPCN because I sit on their board, International Children's Palliative Care Network. And I reached out to one person on the board and I said, Joan, I know I'm crazy, but we got to at least try. She says, okay. And she emails 15 people, including me, on an email chain. Through the 15 people, and four days later, we found mom in a refugee camp. And as part of that, the way that it worked is so many people said, no, I don't know. I didn't have a picture of mom. I didn't even have mom's name. I finally got a first name, and then finally I got a last name. Somebody sent a picture. Is this mom? And I said, I don't know. Let me send it to the hospice. And dad said, yes, that's mom. So finally, I get three wrong phone numbers for mom, as you know happens sometimes. I finally get a correct phone number for mom. And we agreed to set up Skype, which meant that the other person that actually did find mom, by the way, was a human trafficking office. Are you with me here? We have got to start expanding our consciousness on what's possible, because it's not all about us. It's not about us. So a human trafficking office in the continent of Africa found a mom in Zimbabwe at a refugee camp. And these people are not medical providers. This is just how it's got to happen now, folks, because we have got to start reaching our tentacles far and wide to include everybody in the circle of compassion. I find mom, I am over the moon. Okay, let's set up Skype because I'm an American and as a gringa, I just said, ah, we'll just set up Skype. No problem. I see the person from, I see you back there laughing. <laughs> <laughs> because this is what we do as Americans. Eh, got it. We're going to set up Skype. No problem. With the UN office, who has to go kilometers and kilometers to fetch mom. Oh, okay, no problem. Well, they said, well, we'll fetch mom and we'll call at 8 or 9 or 10 or 11. So they fetch mom. And they were very responsible and respectful, by the way, but that meant that it was 1 a.m. our time. And at this hospice, the then director said, well, I have to be there. And I said, well, great, you can be there at 1 a.m. because that's when the call's going to happen and it's going down. And I'm talking to mom and I'm connecting mom and son because this dying child wants to see his mom. Oh, but I don't want to get up at 1. Well, I'm sorry, the call is going to happen. Let's get somebody else on your team because we have to be creative and participatory. The first call happens, mom finally sees her son. 
sees his face, and he is dying, and he has cancer. But what happens in Atlanta is that I get another call and another call and another call connecting all these people. And somehow, somebody leaks the information in the press. So then what do you think happens? No bueno. So it turns into a three-ring circus. Everybody pulls back. But here's where the amazing miracle things happen. It's through technology we actually set up four more phone calls between mom in a refugee camp and dying child. True story. Except, here's the thing, and I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to pinch your finger and promise me that you're going to learn how to use Skype and WhatsApp and FaceTime. Because the very first time we set up the Skype call, the nurse in the room took the iPad, that was new, which was a very generous thing, took the iPad and set it down on the dying child's bed like this and said, I need to give them privacy, and left. So mom is looking at what? The ceiling. So then I'm on the phone, using the cell phone at 1 o'clock in the morning, waking up the nurse saying, will you please call the nurse's station, because I didn't have the back line and have the nurse come in. So what, where does she hold it then? She's walking like this down the hallway, right? Who wants to see up anybody's nose? I don't. The problem was that nobody knew how to turn on the stinking iPad for a video chat, and it just goes and goes and goes and goes from there. We finally got the four calls done over the span of three weeks. The child starts to die. We work with translators from a number of agencies. And mom is allowed to finally speak with son. In, they speak Lingala and Swahili and French. So through numerous interpreters, none of who were medical professionals because we also have a shortage of that in our country, and they're just not available at the drop of a hat. But mom is finally encouraged to give son permission to die today at 11 when she talked to him. Actually, I started at 3 AM, Skyping between mom and the hospice. And the reason that I did it here in the hotel room was because there were issues on both sides, but mostly on the American side, because there is a lack of technical expertise in using Skype, folks. I don't need to be the conduit. You don't need to be the conduit. But somebody needs to be the conduit at your hospice. And everybody should know how to use Skype in a hospice, or FaceTime, or whatever is HIPAA compliant. It's not acceptable anymore to giggle and say, oh, <laughs> I don't know. It's not acceptable. We are not doing a good enough job on behalf of our patients and our families because that is their language. They do not use goals of care. They do not use objectives. They do not use a map of how to talk in medical vocabulary. They use Skype, they use FaceTime, and they use WhatsApp. And we have got to do better because I got to tell you something. This kid who was a refugee, he is not the only case that I have been on like this. And I don't know how long I'm going to live on the planet, but doggone it. I am begging you to do better with this. And if I sound angry, I think it's just because I'm sad. I am very sad. I go to hospice after hospice. I do these talks on, I have like 17 talks. A lot of them are on communication between patients and families. Bundles of research. But I'm telling you, if you do not know how to use Skype in your hospice, and I understand about HIPAA and Wi-Fi and compliance, then use the patient phone to call the patient phone and figure out how to do it and get a family member to download Skype or WhatsApp. Because we are a country of refugees, and they deserve better. All of our patients deserve 
better. They are using WhatsApp to communicate. They are using FaceTime to communicate. Only we're giggling because we don't know how to use it. Are you kidding me? It is time to wake up and get with the program here. And I'm not, I promise you, I'm not chiding and I'm not, I, I am not trying to tell you how to practice medicine because truthfully, I am in awe of what you do. I am in awe of the way that so many of you have to fill out form after form and deal with EMRs and all the policy and legislation that I could ever fill my head with. But we're missing the boat here. We're wondering why we are having problems with communicating with patients and families, and in large part it's because we are giggling when we start talking about Skype and WhatsApp and FaceTime. Because they are real and they are valuable and they are part of us to do our job better with the patients and families that we serve. And by the way, having one person on your team that knows how to do it is not enough, folks. Okay? Because guess what? Mom called her son at 2.45 today. And no one in the room knew to pick up the phone. And the kid died 15 minutes later. And forgive me for going in and out, but I got to go call mom. And I'm working with the UN to be the person to give mom the bad news. Because as much as we think that in cultures, that somebody would tell mom and the family, I mean, for gosh sakes, she's got seven kids here and dad, that's not their culture, right? It's not their culture. So I'm going to go use WhatsApp outside and call a refugee camp in the middle of the night and tell mom that her child died. We've got to do better. Our patients deserve it. If we as members of the helping professions can help the patient and family to get in touch and in tune to each other's needs and come to an acceptance of an unavoidable reality, together we can help avoid much unnecessary agony and suffering on the part of the dying and even more so on the part of the family that is left behind. I've been to so many of your sessions. I have been watching you as I was sitting up there with mom Skyping and I'm listening and I can see you on live stream because I don't speak Lingala and I don't speak Swahili. So I'm watching your sessions. I am so honored to be at this talk because you know what? You guys in this state, you all are leaders. You are. I do this all over the country. You all are leaders. And I know you are. And I'm very proud to be here. So please don't let my ah, frustration okay, scare you off. I'm so thankful. You guys are having conversations about opiates, Your ha which is in another state. <laughs> OK? You're having conversations on end of life and conversation and communication and technology. And you're sharing and you're collaborating. Please stay as part of this coalition. Please continue to dial in if you can't participate in everything. Pay attention to the course offerings at CSU. And thank you for being here, by the way. And thank you, Judy, for continuing to lead the charge on legislation and policy. Because I got to tell you, it makes people like me nuts. I'm not cut out for it. So thank you for your continued work. And in closing, I want to tell you that our palliative care team created a roadmap for a healthier existence for all of us during Austin's life and following his passing. The only reason I'm able to do, that, do this work, which I have now become trained and educated on how to do, it's because of our palliative care team. And I know that I'm going to remember our palliative care team. I know that your patients and families are going to remember you. They just don't have the ability to get up here and thank you themselves. So on behalf of all of them, I really want to thank you for the gut-wrenching, back-breaking work you do. It is worth it because you're not just treating the patients and their families now. Children are watching. Children are watching how their parents die. They're watching how their parents live. They're watching how their siblings die and live. They're watching how everybody around them acts. And if we want to have a safe and secure future, for our children and our grandchildren. And for those of you that have shown me your grandkid kid pics this week, I love it. But we should start thinking about these grandkids. 
We really should because they are watching. And we can and will build a better healthcare system and a better future for our entire country by constantly remembering we are not treating the patient or the family. We are creating generational healing and I know it makes a difference. I know it does. So as a mom who had to remove nutrition and hydration from her child, to a mom who's done research and works with close to thousands of families, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for staying here to hear this very last keynote. Because <laughs> you have a choice. So thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.